Good evening, and welcome to the Marine Minor Cook FNM. My name is Henrietta Toivonen, and I'm one of the Ask Fellows this year. Our event tonight is called Math for the New Millennium, Ideas that Change the World. We will explore some of the remarkable problems and ideas in several branches of modern mathematics. Our speakers will discuss how this elegant discipline, considered both an art and a science, can be used in the process of scientific discovery and technological innovation. Next, I will invite Michelle Goodwin, a senior majoring in mathematics, to introduce our panelists tonight. And I just want to remind everyone that audio and visual recording is strictly prohibited. Hi, thank you so much Henrietta for that wonderful introduction and I hope to do just as well on kind of further delving into what we'll be talking about tonight. As uh, she said, my name is Michelle Goodwin and I'm a senior here at Claremont McKenna. I study pure mathematics, which is probably one of the best fields you can go into. Um, <laughs> I knew I'd get a round of applause from this crowd. I, I kind of stacked the audience for that one. Um, so I guess I just wanted to start off with why you know, math is so important. Math is what underlies every single thing we do every day. For everyone in the room who's a true CMCer and does econ, we are what makes your study actually work. <laughs> so please give us credit for that. You know, everything we do informs how we interact with each other. All of our math goes into the technologies that go, you know, and help us call our friends across the globe and help save people, people from different uh, ailments. Everything we do go into technology, go into the new sciences, and help make our world a better place for every single one of us. So math is the cornerstone for every single thing you do day to day. And so when thinking about that, we brought a panel before you of four different math professors here at CMC. Our math panel is probably one of the best, at, at least I think it's the best in the world, but definitely the best of the five colleges. And we have four brilliant math professors, and I'm going to go into a little bit why each one is special and what they're talking about. So our first speaker will be Azamat Oksoy, who received her PhD from the University of Michigan in mathematics uh, and has been teaching at CMC since 1987. I know she doesn't want people to know that because she looks like she's 25. Um, <laughs> she does. <laughs> um, but she actually will be speaking tonight about invariant subspace problems, which is an area of mathematics in functional analysis. It's a famous unsolved problem. And for those of us in the room who are like, isn't math all unsolved? I can't even find x. This is where they really can't solve the problem, which leads us to say that math is one of the most exciting and still mysterious subjects that we have. So she'll talk a little bit more about the Hilbert space and non-trivial invariant subspaces, which are all words you don't understand right now, but she'll make sure you understand them by the end of the talk. And then after her, we'll have Blake Hunter, who received his PhD from the University of Davis, or UC California Davis, in applied mathematics, specifically with an interest um, now, and he's in really researching into data mining, which is something we hear about day to day. Uh, data mining is how social networks work, Twitter, um, uh, image databases, movie recommendations, if you're wanting what to watch, he works on things like that. And he'll go into kind of discussing topic modeling, which is how linear algebra, a subject that some of us understand what the algebra part means, and we'll understand what the linear part means too, how to find the hidden underlying thematic structures in these massive data sets, things that we can't even quantify. They're just so big. After uh, Blake Hunter, we'll have Professor Chu Yen Kao, and she received her PhD from the UCLA. So very close, but has chosen to share her skills here at CMC. She'll talk about how level set methods and dynamic imp uh, implicit surfaces work to make it very successful for the applications on fluid dynamics, so kind of how like, oil rigs work. Um, and how crystalline growth, so sciences, combustion, uh, and image sciences as well. So everything we do from, you know, mapping the brain to figuring out exactly why, you know, you who are studying biology actually can do what you do in the science lab. And then after Chu Yan Kao, we'll have Lenny Fuchansky, my thesis advisor, so treat him really, really well, please. <laughs> um, he'll, he received his PhD from the University of Texas in Austin. He'll talk about the ABC conjecture. 
I, we're not in a literature class, so ABC actually relates to mathematics, I promise. Uh, these are some of the connections on how the Diefentein analysis is a major branch of number theory and how this problem specifically hasn't been proven yet, which is why it's called a conjecture, and how it really impacts uh, Fermat's Last Theorem, which is something there's even been movies made about, really, money spent on movies about Fermat's Last Theorem, mathematics is that important. Um, so he'll speak about that as well. And I just want to implore upon all of you to, to focus and listen and think about how everything that's going to come before you today relates to your life in some special and different way. How that everything you do should lead you back to the concept of mathematics. So with that, I would like to invite up Azimon Oksoy to start off our presentation. Thank you, Michelle. Good evening. <laughs> you can hear me OK? Yeah, all right. Well, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, as Michelle said, four of us, we are going to talk about some open problem in our respective fields. It's not easy for a mathematician, especially for a pure mathematician, to talk about their research. Um, as you know, uh, mathematicians uh, enjoy the advantages, but suffers the penalties of talking this special language. Well, um, so um, let's start with, uh, well, I'm going to talk about invariant subspace problem, as she uh, mentioned. But let's talk about what mathematicians do. You know, who is a mathematician? And here is a famous quote from a famous person, Paul Erdős, it says, a mathematician is a machine for turning coffee into theorems. <laughs> and here is a list of people who like to drink a lot of coffee, because it's coming a lot of theorems from our department. And I would like to introduce you for, to my you know, wonderful colleagues. The smiley faces are not represented in this picture. <laughs> uh, but. Um, uh, here is my, uh, you know, wonderful department with wonderful members. Here, this is Diana Nidal. Her uh, research is in compressed sensing. She also looks at large data, and she makes sense of those things. This is Mike O'Neill. He talks uh, uh, about harmonic analysis. He thinks really deep about several issues in harmonic analysis. This is the coolest of us, you know, <laughs> Sam Nelson. And, you know, I don't think there are anybody in Claremont Colleges who wrote more papers, joint papers with students than Sam. And here is another cool guy. That's, you know, Mark Huber. Computational probability is his uh, area. And then I'm not, I'm just skipping the ones who are going to talk. You are going to see them. And here is Jerry Bradley. Okay, he is, uh, you know, he wrote a lot of cool, um, well, I'm using cool, to, uh, you know, because I'm trying to relate to you guys, okay? <laughs> That's not usually in my vocabulary, but anyway, you know, he wrote these uh, calculus textbooks which are used around the world. So he's, he's actually quite uh, successful in math education. And here is Art Lee, our computer scientist. Some helps him to teach some of the classes. Uh, in computer science. You are going to see Blake. Blake is our newest member. That's why he's not represented there. And this is for Rob Valenza, who was absent that day, so you are not seeing him. OK, well, some say that mathematics is an art, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking art about mathematics. OK, here is you are seeing a famous picture by Winslow Homer. This hangs in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And I like this picture. She's pointing out to some triangles and circles. You know, and uh, I like the way she dressed, too. <laughs> Not bad, you know. OK, so what is mathematics? Well, here is a person who made immense changes in mathematics. This is probably the most universal, most influential mathematician of the you know, uh, 19th and early 20th century. This is a German mathematician, David Hilbert, which I'm going to talk about an invariant subspace problem, which is posed in these spaces. And here is the quote from him about what is mathematics. It says, mathematics is what 
competent people understand the word to mean. When I first read this, I said, gosh, this is not very inclusive. Did they translate this wrong or something? You know, uh, because obviously he said something in German. I don't think they did wrong. And I will try to explain what he is trying to say through invariant subspace problem. OK. So this, as Michelle said, my area is in functional analysis. And one can define functional analysis in a variety of ways, but I would like to, you know, just quote a great practitioner of functional analysis, Gelfand. It says, functional analysis is the machinery of present day physics. Okay, so let's leave it there. I'm not gonna go into these things because I might not have time. I was I made an attempt of trying to explain pure versus applied, but let's, if you have a question at the end, I'll try to get my two cents in it. Okay, well, here is the problem, invariant subspace problem. Does every operator acting on a separable Hilbert space have a non-trivial invariant subspace? Okay. You breathe first, right? Okay, when you hear it. Then you say, what is this? What's an operator? What's a subspace? As if I'm not just going to understand what a subspace is, I need to understand trivial subspaces and invariant subspaces, right? And then everything is happening in a Hilbert space. So what are these spaces are like, right? That's what you will ask. Okay, let me start talking about what an operator is. Okay, V is for a vector space. Vector space has a structure that you can add things and you can do scalar multiplications, just has a structure, okay? And an operator operates on this vector space, but it's a self-map. What that means is that takes V into V and it's a linear map. Okay, to make things real, let me give you an example. Suppose you have a vector space made of polynomials. You cannot get any more friendly than polynomials in mathematics, you know. <laughs> so you have polynomials, and you are taking your operator, you are you know, acting on this operator and taking the derivative, okay? That differentiation is an operator. It's a linear operator because as you learn early in your studies in math, derivative of sum is sum of the derivatives, right? And then you know how to handle derivative of a function or a polynomial with a constant. Okay, so this is an operator. It's a you know very uh, innocent looking operator, but that's not the only operator. There are other operators. Here is my favorite one that I teach in linear algebra. This is what's called shear transformation. See, it's the self map. It's going from two dimensional space into two dimensional space, and this uh, you know. Uh, Square is slanted under this shear operation. See, you can write a matrix for this T. You can tell what this T is very clearly. And see, it seems like this from one to two is remained same here, even though I, you know, operated on this space, took that region, and then slanted it. So like if you do that to your favorite picture, Mona Lisa, then, a, you know, Mona Lisa's picture gets slanted. Okay, what's a subspace? Okay, I'm going to use the letter W for a subspace. V is your vector space. W lives inside V and has the same structure of V. Okay, so it preserves the structure of V, but it's part of V. It's not the whole V. Okay, for example, what you are seeing here is uh, you are seeing some subspaces in R3. Okay. Many subspaces here. Well, if you think about it, this is not exactly the case, but if you think a map from one plane here to another plane, as we have done um, you know, in calculus classes, when those planes intersect, there is a line of intersection, right? Which we were trying to find the parametric representation. That seems like in that map is not being um, changed. So what is the trivial subspace? Trivial means two extreme cases, okay? If the subspace is just zero, I'm not interested. If the subspace is the whole thing, I'm not interested, and I'm calling them trivial subspaces, okay? And um, so, what is invariant? Invariant 
is what the word says invariant. W is going to be invariant if you take, if you apply T on W, but still it's in W. Okay? So see, here, um, this W is inside this, and you are applying your operator. So T of W is a subset of this, but it's still in W. Okay? It doesn't get changed. It's staying invariant. Okay, here's an example. Suppose V is polynomials of degree less than or equal to 7, and W is polynomials degree less than or equal to 4. If you do your differentiation operator, if you have a polynomial of degree 4, take the derivative, you get polynomial of degree 3. So it's still inside this class. It's still less than 4. So, um, for example, this is an invariant subspace. Do I, do I know what are invariant subspaces? Yes, you do. There is no shortage of invariant subspaces because eigenspaces are invariant subspaces. You might not know what eigenspace is, but let me make an attempt of explaining to you that this is R, right? This is R. And if you look at this guy, W, that's some multiplication of x. So that's a one-dimensional person. Okay, there, W is a one-dimensional man. And if you have a non-zero vector, x, in your space, and if A of x is lambda x, you are getting, um, you know, you are getting an element in W, and that is invariant, and it's one-dimensional invariant subspace. If you had linear algebra, of course you know that either, you know, range or the kernel of the map is our invariant subspaces automatically, but again, we are looking for other things. Okay, what's the Hilbert space? Well, I'm not gonna give the definition of Hilbert space, but it's part of the vector space, and it's the space which makes it possible for you to define length and angles. Okay, that's very fundamental, right? For example, think about three-dimensional space. What makes it different that I can define the length, I can define the angle between vectors. So Hilbert space is something like that. Okay, now I'm going to revisit invariant subspace problem. Does every operator acting on a separable Hilbert space? I'm totally putting separable under the rug. I'm not defining, I'm not going there, okay? So uh, separable Hilbert space have a non-trivial invariant subspace. So operator, V to V, subspace, part of V with the same structure, it's vector space itself. Trivial subspace, the two extremes. Invariant subspace, I cannot move the elements. If W is in W, when I apply T, they are still in W. They are the invariant ones. Hilbert space, think about infinite dimensional version of the three-dimensional space, okay? Your Euclidean space, the space that we live in. Okay, with newfound competence, we have better understood the problem, right? And that's why maybe Hilbert is saying mathematics is what competent people understand the word to mean. He's giving us a thumb up, okay? Hilbert is with us. Okay, well, if you are not mathematically inclined, you can zone out on this uh, slide, okay? What I'm, but I, I have a point to make, okay? The point is that when you have a problem, you have some hidden beauty that you are trying to discover, so many people will work on it, okay? Bit by bit, as if, you know, they are doing little sculpturing, bit by bit, they bring light into the problem. And so this gives the short history of invariant subspace problem, it started in, you know, 1930s with von Neumann, which showed that every compact operator on a Hilbert space of dimension at least two has an, a non-trivial invariant subspace. Then Bernstein and Robinson comes along in 1966. They use non-standard analysis to prove that if T is polynomially compact, then it does have invariant subspace. Then Lomonosov in 73 says, oh, if you have an operator T and that commutes with a compact operator, then that operator has an invariant subspace. See how, you know, like we are building on each other's knowledge. And then like Lomonosov's proof is so complicated and a lot of people don't understand. And then this guy comes along in 78, in five years he simplifies the proof. He gave us something very friendly, and then we can make more progress with that proof. And 
The last one, I, I don't mean to say that there is nothing happened between 78 and 2009, but the last one that I want to say, these two gentlemen, two mathematicians, they gave a construction of a Banach space. You don't know Banach space? That's okay. That's another vector space. Okay. Uh, that every operator is of the form compact plus scalar. This was an open problem by itself very long time. Compact plus scalar problem it's called. So if you are on this type of Banach spaces, then you have invariant subspaces. But not every operator has an invariant subspace. Okay. For example, in 1978, MFLOW gave an example of an operator with no invariant subspaces. That was a very, you know, it is quite an ingenious, you know, argument that he uses. And, I mean, you probably hear about this math problem getting this price, this math problem getting this price. Sometimes when we talk about clay, you know, problems or so on, that we say, oh, if you solve this, you get two million. Mathematicians do mathematics for the sake of mathematics, and this guy certainly did that, and this was the price, okay? <laughs> and this is a true story. I visited the house, this goose was cooked, okay? <laughs> so they gave me this picture I'm showing to you. So this is Mazur, and then they said, oh, you did something really good. This is in Poland, okay? And they gave him this goose, and, and the you know, <laughs> person who cooked it told me that it took a very long time. So, you know, apparently he was a good musician, so he played music, so they had a good time. Okay, here is another thing which I put this picture because I kind of feel sad that uh, Charles is not with us anymore. And um, Sandy Grabner uh, organized a conference in, in Claremont in uh, 1999. Charles came and I met with him then. He really liked Claremont. He told me that Claremont is a nice place that you can prove a lot of nice theorems. And Charles himself was very talented, okay? And in 1980, he constructed operators with only trivial invariant subspaces. See, that's different than the Enflows one, right? The, you know, he's constructing an operator uh, with only trivial invariant subspaces. So actually a lot of people were thinking that if somebody is going to settle this problem, it was this guy. Unfortunately, life didn't let him continue. But why do you care about the invariant subspace problem? Well, because it's a very good problem. But the reason is uh, that it's like um, you would like to, you have a structure and you would like to divide that structure into pieces and you understand the pieces, right? Then it's easier. So those pieces are, could be the invariant subspaces. So it's somehow, if you take a Banach space and write this as direct sum of easier Banach spaces, then you are understand the structure. Well, here is a person, this is Timothy Gowers, who got the field medal for uh, thinking about in decomposable spaces. But he used Banach space and function analysis techniques together with combinatorial techniques. So this also, maybe there is a lesson there in mathematics. If you know, beside your own area of expertise, one thing else, then you can maybe say something more interesting. You know, so I think this is an example for that. Okay, the invariant subspace problem has yet to be fully solved. However, if you ever go to Göttingen, I recommend that you visit Hilbert's grave. Okay, this is the David Hilbert's grave. And I'm sorry that I couldn't you know, enlarge this part. What this part is saying, this is the writing there. It says, wir wissen, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. We must know we shall know. That's the attitude of a mathematician, okay? <laughs> you, you, you need to know. Okay, well, here I just wanted to say a couple of things about the calculus. And uh, you are seeing here two, you know, four players here. Uh, Newton and Leibniz, you all know. Here's there was fundamental theorem of calculus, which was around 300 years ago, okay? Then, Fourier comes along 200 years ago, defines Fourier transform. That trans takes a function and transforms to something else. And then 100 years ago, Radon defines Radon transform and Radon measures. 
That's why you have MRI and tomography today. So there is a direct link with the calculus you are learning and your health, okay? But I always, you know, thought that there is an unreasonable, almost unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And I would like to give one side that I have seen. This is Cantor. He is the father of set theory. This is the guy who taught deep about infinity, okay, and countability. This is Alan Turing, okay. He is the father of computers. Incompleteness principle, Gödel, which you know shook not only mathematics, philosophy, okay. And this is von Neumann. Well, you know, he's father of many things. But if you are among us that are any economist, you know, he is the father of game theory. So he also gave, you know, improved a lot of things for the, uh, your life. Here is the thing that I am seeing. Cantor gave some beautiful results, but they were non-existence, non-constructive existence results. So there, he wasn't giving you a recipe. He was proving something about the existence of things, but they were non-constructive. That made um, Goodell to think about, um, you know, foundation of mathematics. And Goodell uh, basically said, if you have a mathematical statement, they could be true, they could be false, or they are undecidable. So this guy, which you might have seen imitation game, you know, they were telling about his story, Turing's story, okay? This guy said, okay, why don't I build a machine which determines the truth, you know, like which classifies, okay, this is true, this is false, and this is undecidable. So found the focus on foundation of mathematics give to the theory of computations by Turing. So foundation, you know, you can go away to the Turing, but foundation, you know, focus on the foundation, what this uh, guy did, gave a need for ax putting axioms on spaces. And that is the birth of Hilbert spaces, okay? So foundation also gave rise to the Hilbert spaces. Then Hilbert spaces provided a language for physics. Hilbert spaces have a direct impact to uncertainty principle and the solid state physics. And of course, uh, this person had a lot to do with uh, you know, trying to understand the relationship between mathematics and physics. So Hilbert spaces gives the language to physics. And then here's I have Turing, here's Hilbert spaces and uh, solid state physics. Put solid state physics and the Turing machines, that's the computer age. Okay, so next time when you go to your dorm room and look at your computer for something, or you know, check your phone, think about this guy. Okay, <laughs> this is Greg Cantor. Okay, that's the reason why we have all of these things now. So, yeah, you know, we suffer from the penalties of speaking the secret language, but I'm sorry, there is an unreasonable effectiveness of our subject. You know? <laughs> Okay, so here is a couple of other things that I want to say that, um, you know, we do research with students, we do research ourselves, but all of us, we are very active, we go to conferences, and then we do, you know, uh, things. And then um, sometimes people think that we prove these things and we don't communicate with anybody else. It's true that only, you know, our audience is much smaller than other subjects, but research in mathematics is not a monologue, it's a dialogue. And people have been engaged in this dialogue many years. And as you can see here, this is the first Solvay conference in 1911. Unfortunately, our gender is represented just one person here. Things are a little better, but not perfect still. Okay. Well, conclusion, pure mathematics comes from the pretty patterns, and you are seeing Hilbert's curves here. Let's not get into that. But stays for the revolutionary insights. And I would like to, you know, we decided that we are going to show some of our students' pictures to you guys. As Michelle said, I've been here quite a long time, so I was lucky to work with a lot of students. 
and some of my students become professional mathematicians, and actually two of them are sitting in this room. But I, I'm not going to mention all of them, obviously. So I picked some people that you might remember uh, or uh, you, know, uh, you have seen them. This is Will Feldman on the left. He finished uh, CMC, and then he went to UCLA, and he got a PhD. He's a postdoc in University of Chicago now. Okay, and then this is one of my favorite, you know, students. Uh, this is Usha Kwatawala. Okay, she graduated some time ago. She went to New York to the Teachers College, and she did a PhD in math education. She is very influential in the secondary education of math, especially in New York. And you know, uh, I keep getting Christmas cards uh, from her. She tells me what she's doing. She is a wonderful, you know, uh, product of CMC. And then here is another person. This is Brian Marozzi. We wrote a paper about hyperconvex spaces with him. Brian also finished his PhD in Washington University, St. Louis, after CMC. He is working for an environmental agency now. This is Zach Glassman. Zach and I, we uh, did a work on uh, universal spaces, Eurozone universal spaces. Zach is a graduate student studying physics in University of Maryland now. And then here is two other students. This is Kyle Kinenberg. We worked with Envitz with him. Kyle is uh, employed in University of Rice, uh, Rice University. Now he, he also finishes PhD. And then here is a person who is sitting over there. He is Sixian uh, Jin. He is a CGU student. He is going to finish this year. Sixian uh, and I we wrote a paper about equivalence of definitions. Okay, well, I told you that I've been really lucky to have very good students, but I also have been very lucky to have very good teachers. So, in closing, I want to mention one of my teachers to you. I'm originally from Turkey, I'm Turkish. So, you are seeing here 10 Turkish lira. I'm sure, Michelle, you used that when you were there, okay? I don't know if you noticed this. This is uh, one of my teachers, okay? His name is Jaid Arf. What you are seeing here is called Arf invariants. Okay, they are, these are topological invariants. And one advice that I got from him is very precious. He told me, he said, mathematics doesn't get old that fast. Okay, something could be, you know, thousand years and still you might find some use in it. Still there is an originality that nobody catched yet. Okay, so he told me that I should read from original sources. I thought that was a great advice. And you see, my teacher's advice is right on the money. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, before I go, I would like to introduce my colleague, Blake Hunter. Blake is you know, a new member of our department, but um, he, you know, does, um, he uses numerical linear algebra to make sense of data. And you are going to see what nice things he is doing. Thank you, Asma. OK, so um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, so I want to talk about something that's actually not math at all. Well. <laughs> It's a little bit of a lie. It's actually um, an intersection or the union between math, computer science, and statistics. So it's not just math. There's some computer science in here as well as statistics. So if you guys are looking for just math, I'm sorry. You're not getting any. You're just getting a mix. OK, so as we gain more and more information, it becomes really, really hard to find what we need amongst this information. So even before we had the internet and before we had Google, it'd be really hard to search through a really large library to find what you need. Right? You could have to go from multiple libraries. You can just use a city library. Maybe you had to fly to New York to find the book that you want. And then you have to search through this library and then read through all the pages to find the piece of information that you're looking for. So as the amount of information grows, it becomes really, really difficult to be able to find what you're searching for. So you can think about before Google, it was all about trying to collect information. Right? But now, since we have things like Google and we have the internet, we have all this information at our fingertips, but we just need to be able to figure out how to mine through this material. How do we dig through all this material to find exactly what we need, right? Now we have way more material than we can ever possibly use. Now we've got to find the information that's actually useful to us. So we're looking for tools that can try to find this information. 
This information is extremely hard to find, especially because the information that we get on the internet is not in these beautiful, you know, well laid out structures where we have a curator that can go through and figure out, oh, these are all the math books. In these math books, or these are all the same type, so they're on this shelf. We just have a huge pile of data, right? We can search across the internet. I can search for whatever. I can search for World War II, and I'm going to get thousands and thousands and thousands of results, billions of results for World War II. But if I want to try to find specific information about World War II, it's going to be really, really difficult to search through people's blogs about some World War II movie versus the actual information that I really need, right? So what topic modeling is going to do is topic modeling is going to try to dig through all this information, try to add structure back into this unstructured data, give us some type of structured data like this that we can then also search through and find the exact book and the exact page that we need to actually pull out of all this mess. So here's just a quick overview of what topic modeling is doing. So topic modeling starts off with data, right? So you can have your favorite data sets. First, picture data as a bunch of books or maybe some type of digital database. Maybe this could be a bunch of things from Twitter. Maybe it's going to be S&P 500 um, stock analysis or company analysis, right? Maybe these are going to be things from your biological experiment, your chemistry experiment. These might be various types of results. You have tons and tons of data and you want to try to process this data, but it's possibly kind of messy, right? If it's Twitter, it's really messy. You've got tons of junk in there on top of the stuff that you need. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to take all this data and we're going to try to, under, we're trying to discover hidden themes, hidden thematic structures inside of this data that we can somehow organize the data. And you can think about putting this data or each one of these pages back into a book. But our books are all still mixed up and they're still laying on the, on the floor. So the next thing we want to do is we want to try to annotate all of our data or all of our, our documents according to these themes that we just found which you can think of that as taking all the books that we just put together from all of our data and we want to store these things into shelves, right? But still, there's still a lot of data here, right? There's a lot of, univers there's a lot of university libraries, there's a lot of city libraries across the world and we still, it's really hard to find this information. So we're going to keep going even farther with topic modeling and we're going to try to organize all of these libraries and all of these books and all of these places and we're going to try to figure out ways to summarize this data and find ways to search and possibly make predictions from the data. So we're going to take data, which we can't really understand because there's way too much of it, try to build this structure so we can eventually get to a point where we can actually understand something and actually try to use the data to solve a problem, right? Okay, so there's our overview of topic modeling. So here's, here's a little example. So our first data set that I want to look at is going to be thought of as just a bunch of documents. So these are documents that are all coming from science. And this is a science article. It's really hard to read because this has actually been scanned into science. So in 1990, 1996, um, Science, which is a really big, I don't know if you guys heard of this magazine at all, no? Maybe? Okay, well, it's a really big magazine. In 1996, they were scanning all their documents and putting them online. They didn't even have digital versions of their documents. Does that blow your mind? When I saw this, I was like, I'm blowing my mind with science in 1996. We had computers. Why? Why would you just scan your, why wouldn't you, they just had one version of the document. Anyways, so here's our document. So we can think of a document as just a bunch of words. So you can just think of this as this random collection of words if you want. But if you're a human and you can actually read, you might look at this document and like say, well, okay, well, there's actually some hidden structures inside of this document. It's not just a bunch of random words. There's a bunch of themes or underlying hidden structures that make up this document. For instance, there might be themes that are talking about things like organism and life and survive, or things that are themes that are possibly talking about genes or what else do we have here? Sequencing. Or there might be things about computers and numbers and computation and prediction. Right? So there's these underlying themes that make up this document, right? As well as other types of themes. This, this is a document about things that are written in English. There's also like real specific details that have to do with a theme that's for specific experiments, right? So there's themes, these underlying themes that make up this document, and we have to try to make sense of all these themes, right? So instead of thinking of a document as just this random collection of words, what we want to think about is we want to think about this document is actually just kind of this collage or this collection of a bunch of these high-level concepts called topics. So these topics are these combinations or these distributions over types of words. So words that appear very similar to each other, we're going to try to put these things together in our head 
and think of this thing, the, all these various words, these all are very similar to each other, they should be belonging together, and this is part of this topic that's representing my document, right? So this document's got words that are coming from this distribution across this topic. And the same thing with the rest of these topics. We have things like brain and nerve, and we have things like data and number and computation and life and evolve and organism. You might think that these words all belong together and they form these kind of themes, right? This is just a list of ordered words, but this is kind of representing what my theme is, right? What my, what my topics are. So instead of representing this document as just this random collection of words, what I want to think about is that this, this document is just this possible random collection of topics, right? So just you take a bunch of these topics and that's what's making up our document where I'm actually drawing each one of the words for my document, I'm drawing from this underlying distribution where each one of these distributions are distributions over these words. All right? Okay, so we have a distribution of topics that's making up my document and then each one of the words for that document, I'm assuming that these things are being drawn from this distribution. Right? Pretty cool setup for a problem. If I have a bunch of data or a bunch of, of documents, I can try to model things in terms of these topics and in terms of how often these topics appear in these things and look at all these distributions. The only problem is, is that in general, when we're given data, we're only given the data itself. We're only given the documents and all the rest of our variables are all hidden from us, right? So these are all latent variables. These are variables that we don't know. So the game becomes, Given a bunch of documents, I can look through a bunch of documents or have a computer search through thousands and thousands or billions and billions of documents. What I want to do is I want to try to uncover these hidden themes, right? These hidden themes that appear inside of our documents. And I want to take my documents, instead of representing it as just a random collection of words, I want to represent it as this hidden collection of topics. So all we have to do is find the topics, find these distributions, and then figure out how these words are being drawn from these distributions. And that will represent my document. Pretty easy, right? Not that bad. So there's lots of ways we can actually solve this problem. Um, if I was a statistics person um, with maybe a little bit of a CS background or a CS person with a lot of statistics background, I might use things like latent Dursley allocation. You probably have heard of maybe some of these terms, maybe some of you, maybe none of you. Um, or Poisson factor analysis, right? So these are more what computer science statisticians work on. Um, and this is actually solved really well. I mean, not completely solved. It's still an open problem. But um, people have done a lot of really good work on this. One of the most famous papers on this is by three authors, um, David Bly, who's at Princeton, um, Andrew Nguyen, who's at Stanford, and um, Michael Jordan. I don't know if you know who Michael Jordan is. So he's as famous as the basketball player, but he's actually a, a computer scientist. And he's at, um, he's at Berkeley. So three really brilliant computer scientists, they all happen to be computer scientists with a big stats background, they can solve this problem. If you're a mathematician like myself with a little bit of a CS background, kind of a blend between these two, you might handle it in a different fashion. And that's called non-negative matrix factorization, which is what I want to talk about um, right now. So we're given a bunch of data, right? This can be a bunch of stock prices or whatever you want to think of as your data. Whatever your data is, give me your data. So I'm going to start off with a bunch of data, and I'm going to represent each one of my documents, and these aren't, these are a higher level idea than just the documents, like a piece of paper. But you're taking all my documents, I'm taking all your documents, and I'm going to represent it as a bunch of words, right? So here's our representation. We have a document, which is just, I can think of it as just a count of how often each one of these words appears, right? So I can just count the frequency of all my possible words, and I'm going to stack this thing up as a vector, and I'm going to lay this thing as a column vector, and that's going to be my first document. And I'll take my, all my data, and I'm just going to stack all my documents next to each other. So I just have a bunch of columns hitting me here, and there's my data, right? But I represent this in terms of a bunch of words, which we thought of as not the real idea of what's going on behind our documents, right? We want these hidden structures to represent our documents. So instead of representing each document as a distribution over my words, or a linear combination of my words, I want to try to think of each one of my documents as this higher level concept. It's made up of these higher level concepts. It's a distribution across these topics where these topics are actually linear combinations of words or these distribution of words. So I'm going to start with a distribution. My document is a distribution over words. Instead, I want to find my document in terms of a topic, a distribution over my topics, where each topic is a distribution over these words. So, we're going to take each one of my documents and instead I want to try to find some type of representation in terms of these topics 
where each topic is also with the exact same structure of the words that we had before for each one of our documents, that's going to make up each one of our topics. So the game becomes, we're going to take this data matrix, which is X, and I want to try to find two matrices, U and V, that when I multiply these two matrices back together, I want to try to get as close as I can to X. Right? You probably have seen eigenvalues before, maybe have seen singular values and singular vectors before, maybe you've seen the eigen decomposition, or maybe you've seen the singular value decomposition. Singular value decomposition should be able to give you the, the best possible results. The only problem is the best possible results don't deal with the fact that this guy is actually a distribution. If this guy is a distribution, that means that each one of those values was non-negative. And if I want to think of this guy as a distribution and these guys as distributions, then each one of those distributions, I want them to be non-negative. So now I'm just going to enforce this new criteria that I'm going to have x is going to be close to u times v, but I just want both of these guys to be non-negative. Right? Before, we had the way to find the best possible solution. If we didn't have these things being non-negative, I add this little extra criteria. This thing is, even if it's positive, the best possible I can get is from singular values and singular vectors. They're going to be possibly negative. Right? Once I've forced these guys not to be non-negative, it's now open of how you can actually find these two matrices. Went from something where we knew everything possibly about, we can have the best possible approximation, to now we know not enough. Right? So this method is called non-negative matrix factorization. It became really popular for solving topic modeling um, by two authors, uh, Li and Xiong. And they made this popular in 1999 in an a paper in Science. And this paper is also probably as famous as this paper by Michael Jordan. Um, both of these papers together, um, they have around 20,000 citations, which might not seem like a lot. You're like, oh, wow, that's a lot. Well, if you compare that to um, the, the common filter, have you guys, do you guys know about the common filter? So the common filter is this technique that's used heavily in um, astronomy. It's used heavily in math, math finance. It's used hemi, heavily in economics. This was the theory that came out in 1960 to help us get to the moon. So we had this delay of communicating with the spacecraft that was going to eventually go around the moon. And they had to figure out exactly where the spacecraft was going to be once it went around the moon. They had to make these little adjustments from the Earth. And they would get these radio signals back that would say, OK, I'm at this position. I'm at this velocity. But we couldn't actually see where that spacecraft was. So we had to, gu we have to guide this unmanned spacecraft around, and around the moon. OK, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit out, a little bit out there. OK, but that paper that basically got us to the moon and got us around the moon. All the Apollo missions are because of this one paper. That paper has 20,000 citations, the same as this paper. That paper was in 1960, had a lot more time to have a bunch of papers built off of it. This paper was built in 1999. The paper from uh, Michael Jordan and his collaborators, that was from 2003, right? 2002, uh, 2006, 2006. Really, really recent, but it already has 20,000 citations, which is a lot. OK, you guys are not impressed. Well, <laughs> it's a lot. If I ever get anywhere close to that number of citations on any one of my papers ever, like, I'm just going to retire. It's just going to be awesome. <laughs> All right. So there's lots and lots of applications um, for this. Um, the applications start to really, really grow. So you first can think of all the possible types of data sets that are dealing with text. So there's lots and lots of text out there. You guys all probably play with text, really comfortable with text. But there's a lot more you can do if you just are willing to break up this idea that a word is not just a word with a bunch of letters. Like, we can think of words as pieces of images. So for instance, my topics, instead of being these various types of themes, my topics might be things like an airplane, where my words are pieces of parts of planes. So this topic is made up of these words this word, which is maybe the corner of the tip of a wing or the f nose of an airplane, but these pieces make up this topic, which is called an airplane. Right? So my document is now an image, and my words are pieces of an image. Right? It's a kind of a higher level idea. But I mean, this is a lot of what mathematicians do, is we take this idea and we just try to extend these ideas to further and further ideas and try to abstract these things out. And this is just one abstraction of that. Right? OK, so instead of taking my image and representing it as a bunch of pixels, it's really hard to then compare other images or search across a bunch of images. So this gives us a way to represent images. So it gives us a way to do representation. Uh, the next one is you can take all these representations, once you have a bunch of images, we can actually do recognition. 
So in this case, I have an object here, which is a playing card, and I'm going to try to search through a bunch of videos, and I want to find the locations of other cards. So in this case, I found a bunch of words that are in here. These are just pieces of my image, and I'm looking across this and trying to find those other words. Just like if I had a document and I had a bunch of words of something, this is this document that I'm doing research on. I'm really interested in this document. I want to search across all of Google and find other documents that are about this. I don't know what the title of this is because I'm doing my own research in it, but I have no idea what the actual people might be talking about in a totally different language. This will give us a way to find all those documents, or in this case, find all the playing cards. Or you can actually, this is me sitting in front of my computer here, this is last summer, and you can actually do topic modeling to be able to identify parts of the images. In this case, I'm identifying where my eyes are, where my nose is, and where my mouth is, and I'm trying to identify these topics, and the higher level topics I'm getting here, I don't know if you can see it, but saying that it gives me my age, it gives me an approximation of the age, and I can also approximate whether I'm male or female, and whether I have glasses, and I have a really strong probability that I'm male, and I have a really strong probability I don't have glasses, which is good, at least we're, we're, on, the right, we're on the right track for that. <laughs> and I've actually pointed out my eyes and nose and mouth. I mean, you, as a human, you can point it out really easily. To a computer, it's really, really hard, but I can do a topic modeling pretty easy. It was pretty awesome. I was impressed. Anyways, you guys are obviously not. <laughs> So we can also take a bunch of images. Say we have Google and I have um, something like Pascilla um, that basically just has a huge collection of data, a bunch of images. And I might want to try to search through all these images. It's really, really difficult. Not very many of them people have actually tagged. So I want to try to find images that are similar to the images that I'm looking at. And we can actually do that using topic modeling. We can also try to explain what's going on in the scene. So Google's really big at this. They tried to Originally, they had a bunch of images. I don't know if anyone played this game. So Google had a, a game that you could play. They would show you an image, and you just had to write as many words that represented that image as possible. They're trying to get you to fill in the stuff that I want her to do automatically. So they're cheating a little bit. Well, not uh, a little bit. They're cheating a lot. Um, but you can also do this with topic modeling. Once I identify that there's these types of topics there, I can also tell you, well, if there's a high percentage of those words, well, then there's probably a bunch of that topic that's being represented. So instead of just representing this as a bunch, of image, a bunch of pixels, I can say, well, this is actually a scene that's made up of sky, water, trees, mountain, and people. Those are all topics that I can learn from doing topic modeling. All right, there's lots and lots and lots of applications. Um, there's lots of applications in social networks. There's applications in biology, in math finance. You can look at how stock prices work together, how two stocks are possibly correlated together. You can look at one company that you're really interested in, and then you might search across all of Twitter to try to find other companies that are, have a similar um, representation in Twitter that maybe nobody else is, is monitoring that have that same type of representation and pull down those companies and say, I'm interested in the company X, but it's really expensive. Is there a new company that nobody knows about that's up and coming that I can search across Twitter for and find that same, find a similar type of company? Um, they also use it in artificial intelligence, so the self-driving cars, they use it in Siri, they use it in uh, Amazon Echo, they use it all over the place. Um, I have a grad student who's actually doing it with audio, with audio and video. She's right now, she's looking at bird calls, so we have a bunch of bird calls, and she wants to identify um, the bird based on its bird call, which is pretty incredible, because these, the audio that we have for that is, is amazing, because we have um, hundreds of birds that are in this... Um, zoo, and you have a recording of all these various birds. So we have certain birds that are cheeping at different frequencies, at different times, at different levels, and so we get these giant mixes, which you can think of that as just as like we have these documents, we have a lot of different themes that are going on, and we want to basically just unravel all the themes that make up our documents. But in this case, our document is an audio file. Okay, so um, I've done a lot of work in topic modeling, and putting in these slides, I think I need to start changing what I work on, because apparently I've been doing this for a couple years. But it's not that bad. I guess a lot of people work on stuff for the rest of their lives. But um, last year I worked on a project with a group of students. I don't know if you know some of these students. Um, Michael and Bo, they're both CMC students. You guys know Michael and Bo, anyone? Okay, so Michael and Bo, they were sophomores last year. They're juniors now. They worked on a project with me doing topic modeling, and we focused on Twitter with a couple of other, so this is, he's now a grad student. He's a postdoc at UCLA. Uh, she's a senior, junior slash senior at Irvine in computer science. These guys are both math. He's in statistics, so again, the blend, math, computer science, statistics, we're all over the place. 
So we had a bunch of data from Twitter. In this case, our data was coming from Madrid. And what we did is we looked at how to find um, all of our topics. Once we did topic modeling, also, I guess I should have done the reverse order. I showed you the older stuff that all these people built upon. But we tried to find clusters in these topics, but we tried to look for these clusters across languages. So for example, if I have a topic that we found here, um, I'm trying to find, a, I'm searching across the rest of the database to try to find other topics that are related, but possibly in different languages. So in this case, the topic we found in Spanish was this topic. Um, this was the one in English. This is the one in Spanish that we thought was closest neighbor. And looks like we're doing a pretty good job. This is talking about a protest in English and a protest in Spanish, talking about the actual locations. Okay, and well, we can also try to cluster these things in time. So we got math, computer science, we got CMC, we got Irvine, we got UCLA, and uh, I didn't get a Christmas card from these guys because I haven't been working with them long enough, but <laughs> they did um, buy me a ticket to this thing called Escape from LA, Escape from a Room, have you guys done this? So Escape from a Room in Los Angeles, and it was really nice, I had a really good time, um, it was awesome. So I was really honored that they, they took me along to help them escape from a room. <laughs> All right, so uh, the year before that, I also worked with a bunch of students. Um, this is Christina. She's actually a junior, she's a senior now at Pomona. I don't know if you know, but she's in math. Um, these guys are all undergrads, or they were undergrads. This is Eric. He was an undergrad, then he became a PhD student. Now they're all PhD students. Um, he was from China. He's now at UCLA in applied math, which is a really good applied math program. He's at... Um, uh, USC, he's at UCLA, and so we have grad students that are about to graduate, which is pretty, pretty awesome, pretty successful. So what we did here is we also did topic modeling, but specifically we looked at topics and we tried to figure out how they cluster in time and how they cluster in space. So for instance, we have a bunch of different topics here. If I look at the various tweets from Twitter, um, we tried to find correlations between their time um, distribution and their um, spatial distribution, and we tried to put these things together, and when we put these things together, we could find things like, oh, this topic amongst, in this case, we had, I think we have 10,000 topics, we had 100, 100 million um, tweets. So we can search through 100 million tweets, and I think right now we're at like two hours. We can search through the whole thing, which is pretty, pretty incredible. All right, so we can read a lot of tweets. Um, we can find things like this topic's talking about Christmas. Okay, well, maybe we should have searched for that one, but okay, that, we can find this automatically through all these hundreds of thousands of, tweet, of topics. We can also find tweets that are talking about graffiti along the subway line in Los Angeles. We can talk about this, you know, various types of tweets that pop up. Uh, the year before that, I did a couple of projects. Um, I worked with the LAPD and a group of, of students here. Again, these were all undergraduates, now they're all PhD students. It's, You'll see in the next slide that we have a lot more people that go to industry as well. But for some reason, there's a lot of PhD students. Um, and so we looked at how um, topics clustered in time and space, which is previously what we built off. We built off this algorithm for the previous one. But here we took um, a, bunch of piece, a bunch of events. In this case, they were 911, call, 911 phone calls um, into the LAPD. So LAPD gave us all their 911 phone calls. And given a 911 phone call, the LAPD wants us to find all the tweets that are talking about that 911 phone call. Currently, they have an officer whose full-time job is to deal with social media. When a 911 phone call comes in for things like shots fired, officer fired, or officer shot, officer down, some things that, are, that need attention, they pull up social media. In this case, we're pulling up lots of tweets, right? So I think we have something like uh, 20,000 tweets. And the officer is supposedly going to read these 20,000 tweets and tell the LAPD what's going on. So what we did is we took these 20,000 tweets and we reduced it down to the tweets that matched not just by location and time, like these blue tweets, but match this shots fired, which not very many people use the word shot fired in Twitter, Twitter, but we can actually make this link using topic modeling, which is pretty cool. And they're actually using this in practice, and I just emailed some people from um, the LAPD, and they've, they've dressed it up a little bit. We're trying to like, I'm working with some people that are trying to sell it, um, but whatever. Um, so they said, oh, your, your algorithm's working. As they said it was a joke. I was like, oh no, it's actually working pretty well. So what I've been working since this project, working on since this project, is given a bunch of tweets, can we find events? So can I predict the events based on Twitter, right? So if there's gonna be a riot or if there's gonna be something occurring, can I figure out that there is an event that's gonna occur? And the one that we found, I just searched during the summer, uh, I had a bunch of tweets from the summer, and I tried to find a topic that just happened just recently. So in, uh, on September 20th, I searched through um, my model and I tried to figure out, okay, what's the most, what's the, what's the newest topic that's developed? in Los Angeles. In this case, it was this topic, which is talking about Emmys, hot Emmys 2015, 
Sandberg, Tonight Good. So it sounds like it's about the 2015 Emmys where Adam Sandberg's gonna be on tonight and it's gonna be pretty good, right? So it's pretty awesome. And we can actually see where all those tweets are and I can pick this thing out amongst, I think currently with Los Angeles we're looking at, I have like 20,000 topics. But I can now search across those 20,000 topics, even the topics themselves we have to data mine. I can search across all those topics and find interesting ones that are, that are now occurring. And I have lots and lots of other projects. Again, a lot of these students are all now grad students. Grad student, grad, he works at a, I'll show you the non-grad students. Um, he works in industry now at a startup. Um, you might know Brendan, he graduated from Pomona two years ago. Um, he's at a startup. Um, Hui, she's at Google right now making way, way too much money. And uh, they're all grad student, grad student, grad student, professor, professor. Uh, but yeah, but they're all grad students. Grad student, grad student, yeah. Yeah, so industry, grad students, we got a lot of them. Been fairly successful. So um, some of my own work that I'm interested in, and I've showed you kind of a glimpse of some of my own projects. I might have too many going on, but some of the things I'm, op I'm interested in that are kind of open problems are things like the dynamics of topics. How do topics change over time, change over, over space? So look at the distribution over time versus distribution over space. Um, this project, I'm working with a, a Scripps grad student, or a Scripps graduate, she graduated last year, um, and a Harvey Mudd grad student, and we're trying to look at the differences in Twitter um, across space and across time. So specifically, we're looking at differences in the use of language from one area versus another area, which is, which is kind of cool. But I'm also interested in how topics evolve over time. So for the science database, it's really nice. There's a lot of them that are out there, and people have been publishing in science for a really long time. And if I find some topic that I think is interesting, I might care about how that topic changes over time. And trying to model the evolution of that topic is actually a really hard problem on how you are actually able to do that. Because these topics aren't using the same words. The same words here are not the same words that are being used here, but they have slowly evolved to form this new topic. Right? So how do we, how do we model that? Right? Completely, completely open problem. Um, another problem that I'm interested in is um, data that's coming from multiple modalities. Um, basically, I have a bunch of different types of data that I can pull in. So I might have a bunch of tweets. I can find topics for those tweets. I can take a bunch of images. I can search for topics across those images. But can I blur those two topics together? And can I improve my model? So in this case, um, I'm able to not just find the tweets that have these, these words that are associated with this topic, but I can also find um, tweets that are related to those images. So it improves the number of, topic, number of tweets I can pull out. And for some reason, there's a lot of stuff on Twitter. I gotta stop, stop working with Twitter. Um, the other thing I'm really interested in is dealing with uh, curated versus uncurated data. Specifically, how can you take something that's curated, like Wikipedia, where people spend lots and lots of time to make these beautiful topics and make these beautiful structures, beautiful documents, how can I use that to use something where people are just blowing up Twitter all the time with just random tweets of like happy faces and random hashtags of everything? If you use Twitter, just stop using hashtags that don't exist. It's, it's really hard to do it. Okay, so how do I use this structured data, this curated data, to deal with unstructured data, right? Okay, so in summary, um, topic modeling is a really nice way to be able to, to represent your data. So you're given your data, you can represent it as a bunch of vectors, we try to find hidden patterns amongst these data, and annotate these data using topics, and then we then can have these higher level structures to do organization, summary, and search. So with that, um, we just, I just showed you that you can use some math and some linear algebra to do topic modeling. And next, uh, Chuyen will talk about, Chuyen Cao will talk about um, the level set method. So thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm Chou Yan Gao from CMC Mathematics Department as well. Today, I'm going to talk about level set method and dynamical implicit surfaces. At this point, you probably don't understand what my title means. Hopefully, after the talk, you will understand it. And I actually, you know, try to add um, AL to the dynamic words. Okay, I really like the word ending with AL. For example, rotational, okay, vertical. Um, horizontal, parallel, so that's why you know you see the AL here. But I really mean it's dynamic surfaces. Okay, hopefully you don't get bored with my talk. Okay, so what are dynamical surfaces? Dynamical surfaces actually appear in the real world everywhere. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple examples. The first example I'm going to give you is the ocean wave. Okay, if you think about the interface between the air and the water, 
Okay, it's really a dynamical surface because it actually changed with respect to time. So the dynamic surface really means it's actually surfaces uh, which are moving or changing with respect to time. Okay, and the second uh, example I want to give you is the uh, formation of the snowflake. Okay, I really like snowflake because if you really pay attention to snowflake, I don't know whether you actually have seen any pictures of snowflake, I mean the real snowflake. They are really beautiful, and none of two of them are actually identical at all. And a snowflake, you know, they form uh, according to the humidity and also uh, the temperature. They're going to form different structure. And the way uh, the shape forms, it's also uh, it's a dynamical surface because it changes with such a time. Uh, the snowflake may consist just one single ice crystal, but it also could be an aggregation of the ice crystals. The last example I'm going to give you in real world uh, is the brain surfaces. Brain surfaces uh, are also so complicated. Okay, as you can see, you know it contains lots of like foldings. Um, it's just a way, uh, 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 a way uh, too complicated to study. Uh, but however, people are actually interested in the evolution of it. So how brain surfaces become so complicated. Uh, you know, in the adult uh, brain, um, you know, actually the brain surface starts from a very smooth surface and it just gradually uh, changes. And this uh, deformation pretty much actually formed in the first trimester. Um, so it's actually quite amazing. I'm going to also give you some uh, fake uh, world examples. Uh, the reason I mentioned about fake world examples is, is because these examples are actually all done by level set method. Okay, so they are actually the real world application of level set method. The first one, I give you the moving scene uh, in the Pirate of Caribbean. So you see the, you know, the, the water wave, the amazing water wave uh, in the Pirates of Caribbean. And the second one is actually the Terminator 3. I, I don't know whether you have watched Terminator uh, movie. Uh, I, I don't really like, you know, like a robots <laughs> killing each other anyway. But, you know, if you actually have seen the Terminator 3, it actually has a very amazing melting scene. Okay, the robot was actually melting. Uh, um, this is actually uh, the TX uh, called uh, Terminatrix. Uh, it's played by the um, Christina uh, Loken. Uh, she was actually sucked to a machine, the uh, accelerator, and then because at that time there was a magnetic field, so that's why you know he thinks she was a robot, so that's why she was sucked to the accelerator, and then she started melting on the machine. You know, if you don't remember the scene, maybe you go back tonight, you know, to check out a movie. <laughs> and that melting scene is actually computed uh, by level set methods. Okay, uh, so I'm going to tell you what are level set methods. So level set methods are actually numerical methods for evolving uh, from, or you can say to capture. Uh, the dynamic surfaces, okay, by zero uh, uh, level contour. It is actually introduced by two professors, uh, very well-known professor. One is my thesis advisor, Stanley Osher, uh, who is uh, currently, at, currently at the um, UCLA Mass Department, and uh, also by another um, uh, professor, Jamie Sensian, uh, in Berkeley uh, Mass Department. Okay, uh, their paper is also highly cited. Okay. Uh, guess how many citations there are? Uh, Blake yeah. just mentioned 12,000. Okay, I think when I checked this morning, um, my advisor's paper is actually 11, more than 11,000. I don't know whether it break the record yet. I mean, 12,000. <laughs> Maybe tomorrow it will break the record. And uh, uh, he's considered top one cited scientist. So uh, if you want to know more about level set method, I really encourage you uh, to study these three books. The first one is written by Sensian. It's on level set method and fast marching methods. Uh, so it's uh, talking, it, the book actually covers more uh, in fluid dynamics and also computer vision and also material science. Okay, and the second book here uh, by Osher and, and Paorgia is actually the green book, okay. Um, it's more on the image processing. So level set method can also use uh, in image processing. As I show you, you know, I have a brain surface, right? So it's an image. So you can actually apply level set to image. And the middle one is the one, uh, most recent one, that's written by my advisor, uh, Stanley Osher, and Ron Fekko, who is a professor in, uh, in Stanford University. Uh, it's on a level set method and dynamic implicit surfaces. You see the spelling is correct here. Okay, I didn't AAL here. <laughs> okay. So what is level set method? Okay, level set method uh, is actually 
uh, uh, very amazing idea. It's so simple, uh, but it actually is so useful. Okay, it basically uses a level contour to represent the interface. Okay, the reason we want to use contour to represent the interface is because the interface can get so complicated, like a water wave. Right, if you think about the surface, you have water particles, they, they can actually break, the wave can break, can merge. So if you just pay attention to the surface, there are a lot of things happening you know, on, on the surface or on the front. So if we use explicit uh, way to represent it, uh, what do I mean by explicit? I give you an example, okay. For example, a unit circle, I would call it an explicit representation. I really tells you, okay, x equals to cosine theta, y equals cosine theta, and theta is between zero and two pi. If I tell you just precisely where the coordinate is, okay, coordinate r, then this is really the explicit way. But there's another way, it's called implicit way. I don't tell you exactly uh, you know, where x, y coordinate are, but instead I tell you a relationship between them. So square root x squared plus y squared minus one equals to zero, it is actually also represent uh, a, a unit circle. Okay, so the level set idea is really like uh, in this way. So if I'm interested, for example, I think about the mountain case, it's, it's an easy way to describe. Think about this mountain, it's changing in time. Okay, if mountain is changing in time, uh, if you think about the 500, for example, 500 elevation contour, it's also changing in time, right? But because we have mountain somewhere, somewhere is high, tall, okay, somewhere is actually not as tall. So, you know, 500 elevation may actually consist lots of different contour. Along the time, these contour can merge, can break, you know, can have new contour creating. Okay, so it would be actually very complicated if you just pay attention to the contour. So here I show you, you know, okay, this is a mountain view, but this is a contour view. This is like a, you know, uh, 4,500 uh, 4, um, elevation, and this is like a 4,000 elevation, etc. So if you just pay attention to 4,000 elevation, maybe there's another contour here, it's also 4,000 elevation. And then if you think about the the, the mountain is changing with lateral tide, and this 400, uh, 4,000 4, elevation uh, contour are also changing with the time, and there are many, probably there are many of them, and it would be actually hard to trace each one of them, and when they merge, or you know, you really need to describe how they merge, and how to actually describe it, because for explicit representation, like each contour, we would probably need to have one way to describe it, but when there are thousands of them, then we're gonna have to come up with many different ways uh, you know, uh, write down the explicit representation. But in the implicit way, instead, you can just use a mountain to describe it. Well, anyway, the elevation, certain elevation is on the mountain. No matter whether I care which elevation or uh, how that elevation change, if I pay attention to the whole mountain, I get all the information. So uh, that's basically the level set, the main idea. Instead of paying attention uh, to just one single contour or multiple contour, you use a object which is actually one higher dimension to describe it. Okay, and so the level set method, of course we are talking about dynamic surfaces. We need to have movements, okay? If you have movement, it's more interesting, right? Because we move every day. If I don't move, then that means I'm dead. That's not good. Okay, so suppose the velocity of interface is given in this way, like a dx dt dy dt equals to v, that means uh, the rate of change of the a location I'm at is equals to velocity. Then the implicit way, okay, you really write it as an implicit function phi x y t equals to zero. If you learn uh, multivariable calculus, uh, then you must know that you know if I take in derivative with respect to t, I'm going to get an equation phi t. Okay, I take I take derivative with respect to the last argument first, so phi t. And then plus, this really is phi x, phi y, and dot with dx, dt, uh, dy, dt, uh, then it's equals to phi t plus gradient of uh, phi dot f equals to zero. That, I mean, really, this f is as uh, the velocity. Okay, so now if I have velocity, uh, I can either you know, solve um, this equation, or I can either actually solve uh, this implicit representation. It turns out, I mean, to solve it in an implicit way, yeah, it's actually uh, much more uh, robust, and also it can actually capture much more complicated uh, ca uh, moving uh, interface problems. So let me uh, just show you a simple calculation. This is just very simple. You have a flower, 
And then the boundary, okay, with the velocity, you know, assigned as just moving out along its normal with constant one velocity. So along the time, you know, this problem is going to look like this. Okay, maybe it doesn't really look like it. it's very real. So this is the professor uh, who is in Stanford. He actually won the Oscar Award. He tried to apply the level set method to movie industry, and uh, as you can see uh, in the movie, I just uh, show you. I don't know why uh, it's, it didn't rewind, but anyway, he can actually simulate very complicated uh, water wave uh, simulations uh, in a tank or even in ocean. Okay, and then he, uh, due to uh, like uh, um, his uh, in, uh, introduction of the level set method into the movie industry, okay, he actually won the Oscar award, and then he created a lot of uh, moving thing, including the the smog in the Jurassic Park, or. Uh, uh, many others, you know, as the Finding Nemo, so you should actually check his website. He has a lot of interesting movies. Okay, and then um, the next one I'm gonna, this is uh, my uh, uh, work uh, with other, uh, other uh, my collaborators. This is a brain surface. So as you can see, we just start with an arbitrary initial gas, a red curve and a blue curve, and we just try to evolve the curve to see whether the machine can tell us immediately how to identify uh, the gray matter uh, surface and then this is uh, one is the, the blue boundary is actually uh, the one the uh, blue surface indicate uh, the gray matter boundary and then this red one okay inner one is actually indicate the white matter boundary and this is the vexel image you can also start from an initial gas and this circle is going to move because it's actually changing right dynamic surface uh, so it's changing and then you will be able to capture uh, the vexel boundary Okay, so as you can see, we are interested in what? We are interested in dynamic surfaces problem. Okay, that's really uh, what I'm interested in. So I have a couple uh, uh, like a research project with uh, my students. So the same uh, Menegon, uh, he graduated in uh, CMC in 2015. He's working on the senior thesis with me. Um, and his thesis topic is quantity figures uh, through the vibrating plate. And, uh, uh, Tarathap and also uh, Gavin uh, were my student in the PD class, and they decided to do a summer project uh, research with me uh, just this past summer, and they work on the shape optimization problem uh, evolving the P Laplace and eigenvalues. And these four, Huyen, Patrick, Vladimir, and Deacon, are CGU graduate students. Uh, they are also working on uh, PD uh, related problem and also shape optimization and solving PD on surfaces. And I'm very glad, you know, to have uh, these students to work on. And I'm also looking forward to work with, you know, some of the potential audience here who are interested in mathematics. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce uh, uh, my colleague Nanny Pushatsky. <laughs> Okay. Hello? Is it on? Yeah. Can, can people hear me? Okay, good. So, um, hi. Um, I will, um, so today I, I will tell you about something called the ABC conjecture, but um, to make things interesting, I'll put a little bit of a mystery show here. So, so here's where the story starts. Um, this is third century of our era, and uh, um, this guy is Diophantus of Alexandria, uh, who wrote a very important book uh, called Arithmetica. So this is essentially the starting point of number theory as a branch of mathematics. Um, so um, in reality, this book uh, is very uncommon for today, certainly. This is just a collection of problems. People don't write this kind of books much uh, today, but uh, back then, so. Uh, he put together a collection of 130 problems on polynomial equations. Uh, so this equations, uh, polynomial equations specifically with integer coefficients. And uh, because of this book and because of his work on these equations, uh, uh, these equations are now known as Diophantine. Okay. So fast forward uh, to 17th century when this guy, uh, Pierre de Fermat, uh, who was actually a lawyer in France. So, so back then, you could still be an amateur mathematician. Doesn't happen that much these days. So people do it professionally now. Back then, he was a judge. He actually worked for the church. Uh, and then his free time, 
to relax. He did mathematics. So I always tell my students that that's what they should do on a, a lonely Friday night. He actually did it. Um, so uh, he made fundamental contributions to several um, areas of mathematics. Uh, most notably, uh, he's considered the uh, founding father of modern number theory. So Fermat was reading Die Fantasis Arithmetica. And uh, um, so this is the particular page. I have to say that this page actually comes from a later edition of the book, which already uh, includes Fermat's remarks. Uh, but so, so this right here, this paragraph right here, is actually Fermat's remark. Uh, the rest of it is original text by Diophantus. So Fermat came across a page with the following problem. So consider an equation, x to the power n plus y to the power n equal to z to the power n, where n is an integer, positive integer. Uh, let's assume n is greater or equal than 3. And the question is, does this equation have solutions in x, y, z? Well, let's, include the, let's exclude the silly solutions. Now, surely I can take, say, x to be equal to 0, and then y to be equal to z. So that's not interesting. I want. Um, Integers x, y, and z, all non-zero, such that this equation is true. Well, so the question is, does this equation have a solution for any fixed n? So Fermat thought about it. Well, does it? Let's see. Now, of course, if you take the simpler case, when n is equal to 2, then we all know that this equation, x squared plus y squared equal to z squared, has a whole bunch of integer solutions. Those integer solutions are called Pythagorean triples. We all studied it in um, I don't know, high school, elementary school, kindergarten. Uh, so, so, um, so here are some examples. So essentially, you take a right triangle, and then uh, so z is the hypotenuse, x and y are the legs. And um, well, so here are some possible solutions. 3, 4, 5, 5, 12, 13, and so on and so forth. In fact, there are infinitely many such solutions. So if you allow your exponent to be 2, then it's all good. Well, if you request the exponent to be higher, so n greater or equal than 3, then things become more complicated. So Fermat specifically claimed in 1637 on the margins of his copy of Arithmetica. So this is a very famous story, right? So on the margins, he had this note. So this is Fermat's marginal note. I have a truly marvelous demonstration that this equation has no solutions which this margin is too narrow to contain. <laughs> so a great number of mathematicians have actually thought about this. So, so in fact, this one little problem motivated development. So the problem itself, in my opinion, is not so interesting. OK, this equation has a solution, doesn't have a solution, who cares? But in reality, the, the fact that a bunch of people thought about it uh, motivated development of several very major, very important areas of mathematics. The entire abstract algebra as we know it today, uh, modern number theory, certainly algebraic number theory is entirely uh, owe its development uh, to, to people thinking about Fermat's marvelous proof. Well, now 357 years later, uh, Andrew Wiles did show that Fermat was right, so this is in 1994, and uh, um, so uh, Fermat was right on two accounts. First, the equation has no solution. Second, a proof does not fit on, on, onto a margin. <laughs> Takes up about 100 pages uh, of extremely difficult mathematics. Well, um, so here's, I, I couldn't resist. I, I found this, right? So, uh, so um, Fermat's mystery solved, right? So, so, so during his uh, second to last theorem, right, the fine pen broke down, and then he was left with the thick pencil, and that's why the margin does not, <laughs> is not sufficient. Right? OK, well, so the question, the question people ask many, many times, and many people still ask this question, is it possible that Fermat actually had a proof? Well, so it is absolutely not possible that Fermat could have known the mathematics that went into Wiles' proof. It's completely 20th century, in fact, 21st century mathematics. Um, well. But 
is it possible that he actually had a really short and genius proof in mind and uh, uh, none of us losers can come up with it? Well, most people don't believe so. Um, so then, of course, the question is, was he bluffing or was he making an honest mistake? And of course, we will never know unless you know, we uh, cut into his brain and, and look a little. There's just so many people into whose brain I really want to look, so <laughs> I, I, I couldn't resist. Um, well, but perhaps we can do a little detective work and what's even more interesting, speculate. Okay, so to speculate, uh, here's, here's, here's a hypothesis. So in 1985, these two guys, David Masser and Joseph Osterley, proposed uh, a problem which became known as ABC conjecture. So this is currently known, uh, currently viewed as one of the most important open problems in mathematics, certainly in number theory. Well, um, so what is the ABC conjecture? So first, let me introduce literally two words of notation. Suppose you have an integer n. So integer is a whole number. Then we define the radical of n to be the product of all distinct prime numbers divided in n. So remember, prime numbers are numbers that are only divisible by, by 1 and itself. So, so here are some examples. Suppose n is 15. So that's 3 times 5. 3 is prime, 5 is prime. These are distinct prime, prime numbers. So radical of 15 is just itself. But here's 16. So 16 is a power of a single prime. So radical of 16 is just this prime, 2. Now 17 is its own radical, so on and so forth. Make sense? So this is radical of an integer. Now one more word of notation. We say that a collection of integers is relatively prime if their only common positive divisor is 1. So uh, no other common divisor. OK, so with this notation, let us state the ABC conjecture. So this is actually a strong form of the conjecture. Suppose A, B, and C are positive, relatively prime integers such that a plus b is equal to c. So c is the largest of the three, you see? Then the conjecture claims c is less than the radical of the product a times b times c raised to the power 2. So let's see an example. So say 16 plus 243 is equal to 259. Then, well, radical of 16 times 243 times 259. So if I factor these numbers into primes, then uh, so, so this is my radical. Right? These are the distinct primes that divide this product, and I square it. And so the radical is this huge number. Well, the radical squared is this huge number. That's larger than 259. OK, ABC conjecture is done. <laughs> well, at least in this particular case. Yeah. OK. Well, let's assume for a second that ABC conjecture is true. So if this is true, let me prove, so, so you know, every mathematical talk, some people say, should contain a proof. Actually, unfortunately, that's, that doesn't often happen. Many of my talks don't contain a proof. But I decided that in Athenaeum, I should show a proof. <laughs> so here's a proof. <laughs> so assume that um, the ABC conjecture is true. Then let me prove to you for Maslow's theorem for all exponents greater or equal than 6. So n is greater or equal than 6. Then look. So, um, Suppose that there exists a solution, x, y, z, to this equation. And so x, y, z are positive, relatively prime integers. Well, now z has to be greater than x and y. Otherwise, this would not make sense. OK, now take a to be x to the n, b, y to the n, c, z to the n. Then a plus b is equal to c. I'm assuming that ABC conjecture is true, right? Then c, which is z to the n must be less than radical of a times b times c squared. But radical of a times b, uh, a times b times c is the same as radical of x times y times z, because the power gets stripped down. OK, and this radical is at most the product x, y, z. OK, so, but x, y, z is at most z cubed. Now, z cubed squared is z to the 6. So, Hold on, this means that z to the n has to be less than z to the 6. Oh, but this means that n has to be less than 6. But I assumed n was greater than 6. A contradiction. This means that a solution cannot exist. There you go. 
Here's Fermat's last theorem for all exponents greater or equal than 6 as a simple consequence of the ABC conjecture. Not too shabby. OK, well, let's speculate a little. Now, hypothetically, you see, the ABC conjecture does not really use any sophisticated terminology. Prime numbers, integers, Fermat knew about this. So one could hypothetically imagine that Fermat thought of an even stronger version of ABC conjecture. So suppose, so, so here's a form of the ABC conjecture that I speculate Fermat could have thought about. So suppose that a, b, c are positive relatively prime integers such that a plus b is equal to c. Then c is less than the radical of a, b, c. Remember, the a, b, c conjecture includes a power here, a square. But this is an even simpler form on the, of the conjecture. And in fact, this form appears to be true, not always, but for many, many triples a, b, c. In fact, counterexamples are known. But in order to find the counterexample, you have to look pretty hard. So you see, this is a triple that is actually the first counterexample. So Fermat, you know, Fermat, say Fermat had not a very powerful computer back in 1600s. So um, then maybe he could, you know, he, he tested some basic examples. He didn't find any counterexample. He said, okay, maybe it's right. Well, let's assume that it is right. Then check this out. Go back to Fermat's last theorem. Now, assume the way Fermat did that n is greater or equal than 3. So you see, I'm essentially copying my previous proof. The only changes are marked in red here. So then the entire argument I just presented to you carries through for all n greater or equal than 3. I am again reaching the same contradiction here. OK, Fermat's last theorem in its entire glory follows immediately from this stronger, albeit not correct version of the ABC conjecture, but correct for many, many triples ABC. OK. All right, well, so um, now, in addition to Fermat's last theorem, uh, many other things follow from ABC conjecture. So many things, m many results that are actually known, uh, many open problems in mathematics would follow quite easily from the ABC conjecture. So. Um, some examples, so, so a couple Fields medals would not have to be given if the ABC conjecture was proved. So 1958, uh, a very famous theorem of uh, Klaus Ross, uh, which earned him a Fields medal, follows from ABC conjecture. Mardell conjecture, proved by Gerd Foltings in 86, follows from, a, from the ABC conjecture. Uh, the famous Catalan conjecture, proved by Mihail Lesko in 2002. All of this, many, many others. So, in other words, if somebody could just come in and solve this thing, we would be done with many, many open problems in mathematics. And this would really consolidate number theory in a big way. Well, so what is known towards the ABC conjecture? So many things are known, but most importantly, there is an outstanding claim of a proof by this guy. Um, so Shinichi Machizuki. So he wrote recently um, four papers. Uh, of total length, 500 pages, uh, so where he claims the proof, it may very well be that he does have a proof. He's certainly one of the reasonable contenders. He would be one. If, if somebody can do it, he's one of the people who can. Um, but uh, the verification is still, uh, is still in progress. It's been three years, and I'm not, I'm not sure we're any closer than we were three years ago. Because, um, so I actually tried to glance at the uh, introduction to the first paper by Machizuki. It's like reading a foreign language. It's, uh, he essentially invents his own framework, which is unlike anything that's been done before him. Um, OK, but well, we can only hope. So how does this connect to anything I do? Um, well, both for Maslow's theorem and the ABC conjecture are problems in Diophantine analysis, which is a big branch of um, number theory. A lot of the work that I do myself and with students uh, is in Diophantine analysis or related areas. So um, here are some of those students. So um, here are two guys who got their PhDs with me uh, in the recent years, working not specifically on ABC conjecture, but on uh, Diophantine problems. Here are also some undergraduate students uh, who did uh, 
sort of research projects with me. So this was, this was a summer 2009 program. Um, so both of these guys are now doing PhDs in number theory. Um, now here are also, so this is a research program in the summer 2011. Uh, so um, these people were also involved in it. So uh, several papers came out of, of, of this work with students. Here are also some uh, senior thesis students who, are, who have been doing this kind of work um, with me. Here's Michelle. <laughs> so we're being, you see, I'm, I, I'm generally an optimist. I'm including students who are not done yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we can only hope. All right, so, um, well, to conclude, uh, we showed you four different directions in mathematics. Well, in reality, math is huge. And uh, it has many, many open problems, many, many important directions. It is very central to technology. And generally, it is just very important in the modern world. So we need you to do math. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time now for just a few student questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and Henrietta or I will come to you with a microphone. Priority Perhaps goes to students. the rest of the speakers would like to join me up on stage. No questions? We have one here. OK. Sure. Uh, could you guys please clarify the difference between pure mathematics and applied mathematics? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, which one's better? <laughs> okay. Uh, can you hear me? I think there is a... Um, I, I didn't show. There's this yin-yang relationship. There is some tensions and there is some, you know, friendship between those two subjects. But the basic approach in pure mathematics when pure mathematician looks at the problem, he or she says, what's going on here? You know, so you want to understand what's going on there. And applied mathematician, uh, some applied mathematicians, when they look at something, they say, oh, how can I apply this method to my problem? So, but they are, as Halmo says, depend on each other. Obviously, you cannot apply well if you don't know what's going on. And when you prove something, that comes to life what we understand through an application to. So we depend on each other, but our approaches are different. Yeah. OK. Well, yeah. I, I, <laughs> OK. No, actually, the distinction, so, so uh, I, I guess what Osman is trying to say is that uh, so pure mathematics addresses a problem in mathematics and uses mathematical techniques to solve it. Applied mathematics often addresses a problem outside of mathematics and uses mathematical right. techniques to solve it. But this distinction, I think, has been really wearing thin in the, in the last 30, 40 years. So there's, I think there's much less of a distinction. Uh, I found myself published a paper in an applied mathematical journal last year. So I claim there is no distinction, seriously. <laughs> I have an easier question for the second speaker, and that is that a long time ago, about 60 years, in fact, uh, in eighth grade, <laughs> I remember learning how to diagram sentences at, with the, you know, the subject and the verb and the object and everything else, and I was just wondering, are they still doing that? Your, your talk reminded me exactly of yeah, that. Yeah, we're not, we're not putting any of that in our models, but you could put these in these models. I mean, there are people that, that study uh, language, they study literature, they would actually look at models that involve, you know, the sentence structure. Um, the only stru sentence structure I've been looking at are certain words following other words. So I basically look at these things called bigrams or n-grams of words that follow each other. But that's the only really model that I stick into. Um, our stuff. We made everything clear and perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with respect to the last speaker, you mentioned it was taking, it's been over three years, and they still haven't been able to prove or disprove um, the gentleman's um, 
whether or not he solved the problem in mathematics. I just was wondering, and you said that they're, no, they're not any closer than they were to begin with. I was wondering, is it common for it to take that long, or is there a specific reason why his work is so difficult to prove or disprove? Well, um, in general, you see verification, so this kind of verification process, or refereeing, uh, um, as they say in the academic world, it, it takes time, right? So especially when you take a mathematical paper to, to read it carefully, to understand it, and to ensure that what is said there is correct, every little detail is correct, that takes time. Uh, in case of problems that are as famous as this one, uh, there's additional scrutiny, right? You, so, so there's more at stake. If you are doing something of maybe not quite as famous, then even if there's a mistake, okay, it's not good, I mean, nobody likes it, but, but not as much as at stake. When it's something this famous, uh, the verification is especially scrutinized. There's usually a team of people who do this. But um, what adds a, another dimension in this case is that he really um, invented or discovered, however you like to see this, uh, a new branch of mathematics, something that truly did not exist before him. So somebody who's getting into this needs to first understand what's going on there, and that takes a long time. This will be our last question for tonight. Oh. Um, I also have a question for Professor Fukshansky, uh, more specifically about the uh, proof of uh, Fermat's uh, plus theorem through the ABC conjecture. Um, so I think uh, you, I think uh, during the proof you said that, oh, like when you stated the conjecture itself, uh, you said that A, B, and C have to be, ha have to be relatively prime for that thing to hold. So like even if we assume that Fermat had this conjecture in mind and uh, like the simplified version in mind, um, still, how would he jump from the conclusion, um, how would he jump from the case when uh, x to the n, y to the n, and z to the n are you know, relatively prime to, to the general case? Well, suppose x, y, and z are not relatively prime. So let's say d be their greatest common divisor. Well, then you can factor out d on both sides of the equation and then cancel <laughs> d to the n, d to the n. So it's, it's easily reducible to the case when x, y, and z are relatively prime. So, so No, no, no. So, so when I say that A, B, and C are relatively prime, I mean the triple is. I'm not saying they're pairwise relatively prime. Yeah. Same goes for X, Y, Z. Yeah. A very big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. And please join me in thanking the math panel. <laughs>